Hello guys, uh, welcome to our first uh, webinar. We are today we are going to talk about uh, exposing Lambda functions as managed APIs. This uh, I'm Amelie Silva. I'm uh, working as a software architect uh, with WS2 API manager team. And this session is going to be uh, co-hosted by Faslan Nasim, who is an associate technical lead uh, working with WS2 API manager team. So let's get started. <clears throat> so this is uh, this is. Uh, the first webinar in our series after releasing 3.1.0. And typically after a release, uh, we do a product release webinar covering the main features of the release. But uh, this time instead, we thought of taking a different approach. We thought of dedicating an entire webinar <coughs> covering uh, an important feature. So today we are going to talk about uh, exposing Lambda functions as managed APIs. The reason we thought of uh, talking about this is because uh, there's an increased demand to use lambdas or generally serverless functions. Many enterprises are looking forward to replacing their backend logic, and they are trying to do it without impacting their existing user base. So with the new release, we have introduced uh, a feature that will help to integrate lambdas, allowing API providers to seamlessly expose their existing backends uh, as lambdas. This will also uh, help them to migrate their backends to a serverless framework without worrying about the business disruption. So, uh, so this is the uh, lineup for today's webinar. First, we are going to talk about serverless functions in general, discussing some of the main characteristics of serverless. Then we'll talk about uh, the advantages offered by serverless, uh, highlight uh, what unique characteristics are provided with this framework. We'll also talk a little bit about the evolution of cloud, just to explain about uh, how serverless fit into the entire journey of cloud evolution. Then uh, we'll talk about AWS Lambdas uh, and how to use it through WSO2 API Manager. Then uh, we'll move into the demo, in which we'll show how easily you can migrate your applications to Lambda framework without impacting the consumers. So let's get started. First, uh, let's consider what is serverless. So uh, talking in very simple terms, we can say that uh, it is the ability to run a particular service without allocating service permanently. Even this definition seems very simple. If we expand on certain terms carefully, we can identify certain characteristics of the serverless architecture. The most important part in this definition, I would say, is that uh, the servers aren't allocated permanently, which in a way means that resources are allocated dynamically. So if the resources are to be allocated dynamically, then the framework should be able to respond to events, which in a way means that serverless functions are even driven by nature. And one important characteristic serverless functions share between the event-driven applications is that they only live until the span of its execution. And this property of short liveness and the ability to be dynamically invoked makes the serverless applications more suitable for stateless processing. But even though they are good at handling stateless processing, not all the operations written using serverless functions are stateless. Many, 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 many users use stateless logic. Many, many users use serverless functions to write uh, stateful logic that would require reading from a couple of databases and then accessing files and set storage. So having discussed uh, what serverless is, uh, let's also try to take a look at uh, why, why we need to talk about them. So before jumping uh, right into the advantages, I'd like to spend some time explaining about the evolution of cloud, since it will help us to understand how serverless fits into the grand scheme of things, and which will also help us to see the true advantages offered by the serverless. So this is one nice illustration I found over the internet, and it nicely explains the uh, entire journey of cloud evolution. <clears throat> so as this uh, picture depicts, uh, before the era of cloud, there were on-premise servers. And even, even though these were cumbersome to handle, these on-premise servers help businesses to make a presence over the internet and to expose their services remotely. Yes, like to host a service, organizations have to uh, had to buy the physical servers, they had to configure the network, and also they had to purchase the storage and they had to own the physical space to keep everything. Apart from that, uh, 
they would also have to keep the staff to manage all of this and they need to own the budget to pay for the upkeep so unless an organization could afford all of this exposing the services over web would be a real problem so like uh, to solve some of this problem ias or the infrastructure as a service was introduced it also can be considered as the first major leap into the cloud this eased out some of the pains by making the infrastructure more affordable and by taking down the capital costs and the cost for maintenance. So an IAS provider would provide the storage, networking and computing infrastructure needed to host a particular service. Then a business would only have to install the OS, the supporting software and other hosting environment uh, needed to run their business applications. For small organizations, IAS was a great relief since it brought down the costs and lowered the barriers to run an online service. Since there was no huge upfront investment, small organizations could still make a presence over the internet with the limited budget they had. So even though much of the operational burdens were taken away, organizations still had to make an effort to keep the services running. Since uh, it was the organizations uh, that uh, installed the software, the responsibility of maintaining and upgrading also fell upon them. And when the demand for resources rose, they would have to manually allocate those, uh, even though the resources can be purchased quickly and they can be allocated on demand. So in short, someone still had to keep an eye on the resource usage and had, a make a cons and, and had to make a conscious decision on when to allocate them. So to solve these problems, uh, the past came along. Pass vendors provided the infrastructure along with the software needed to build an application. They also provided the hosting environment for applications. So a typical Pass offering would provide the development tools to create an application, databases, middleware, logging software to help with the development, and then finally the hosting and monitoring capabilities to run and monitor the application. Now with Pass, uh, the infrastructure along with all the software were maintained by the vendor. This took away much of the burdens of maintenance and all of the operational responsibilities we discussed above would simply fall under the PaaS provider. So then comes the PaaS or like the serverless technology. This can be considered as the epitome of the cloud devolution and uh, PaaS helped uh, to ease out most, most of the burdens related to infrastructure management <clears throat> but while hosting an app, a fixed number of instances were allocated. So even though some cloud vendors provided uh, certain capabilities like auto-scaling, still it was mandated to run a minimum number of instances and practices like these would incur a cost even without processing a single request. Now FAST uh, could take this cost too as it allocated resources on demand now. With the FAST, enterprises could entirely focus on developing applications without worrying anything about the infrastructure management. So simply putting it, FAST or serverless would take care of the entire range of activities from the point of updating the software to the point of scaling the servers. And now, uh, if you take a closer look at the evolution, you, you might notice that with each incremental step, it has helped the enterprises to focus more on application development and worry less about the infrastructure management. And since the cloud providers streamline infrastructure management for a lot of customers, they actually can do it uh, for a, in, in, in a, in a cost-efficient manner. Actually, for a fraction of the cost, any single enterprise could do it. So having operational side managed by the cloud provider is the cost-efficient and the risk-free solution for an enterprise. And the enterprise can use that time and money to do more business-related development. Now, having explored about uh, the evolution of cloud, let's turn our attention back to the benefits offered by serverless. <clears throat> and uh, some of these points were already discussed in the previous section. So I'll be just uh, going through these slides, uh, this particular slide very quickly. Now, uh, since the serverless offered, uh, offers a very cost-effective solution, it may look appealing to a startup or to a small-scale enterprise. Uh, when starting up the business, since they 
don't have an idea how much service they should allocate, they can rely on the serverless technology to, to test the waters. With the serverless, they can only pay when customers are using their services. So even for an established enterprise, moving on to serverless technology would, would offer certain benefits. Uh, by carefully evaluating the existing business applications and porting the more event-driven parts onto serverless framework, the enterprise would be able to cut down infrastructure and operational costs. In addition to the benefits offered uh, from operational perspectives, serverless technology also helped to reorganize the applications uh, in a better and in a more reactive way. Uh, while porting the backend functions, uh, while porting the uh, backends to a serverless framework, uh, applications should be decomposed in a particular way. If you think of an application as a collection of functions, then each of the functions need to be separated according to their business usage. Now, if you think carefully, this is a similar decomposition needed when adopting the microservices architecture. So, in a way, we can say that uh, if an application is already broken down to its microservices, then porting it to a serverless framework uh, is much easier. Now, uh, now, the different functions in a single application uh, can, can behave differently. Uh, and all of the functions wouldn't require the same resource. And all of those, uh, all of the functions don't uh, need to be available at the same time. <clears throat> if we take an online store for an example, a lot of users might browse through the store, uh, but only a fraction of them would sign in and start checking out. And out of those who check out, only a fraction would actually proceed to the payment page and make a purchase. So we can safely assume that calls to the calls to render catalog would be relatively high compared to checkout and payment pages. And when these pages are separated to different functions, it would allow the catalog functions to be scaled independently, only utilizing the resources it needs. Since the application is uh, broken down to, uh, since the application is broken down into different functions, and each function scales independently, the application as a whole would consume a lot less, a lot less resources than it was a single monolith. And then uh, the other point to note is that uh, these serverless functions are event driven by nature and the event driven applications uh, help to run stateless uh, functions very well. And they also respond to real time events in a more reactive manner. That's another advantage offered by the serverless functions. So having discussed about uh, this in general, uh, let's take a look at what lambdas are. <clears throat> so lambdas, is basically the serverless implementation provided by AWS. While creating a Lambda, you can select from range of language languages, like uh, you can create your functions using uh, Go, Python, Java, or you simply can deploy it as a Node.js application. Then while creating the Lambda, you can additionally specify uh, the memory needed for your function. And when scaling the function up, uh, blocks of this memory will get allocated. And uh, further, like uh, as an advanced configuration, you can specify a concurrency level, which would uh, also work as a throttling switch. So while, while creating the lambdas, you don't have to allocate any servers. And depending on the call volume and the number of concurrency you have specified, the framework will uh, automatically uh, take care of provisioning. And pricing is based on the memory you have allocated and the duration for it uh, ran for. Uh, simply the charging is calculated exactly for what you use, uh, not based on um, how old the Lambda is. And while triggering Lambda, it can be triggered uh, either by listening to a change uh, in the system, like a change in the DynamoDB, or uh, through a file upload to the S3 bucket, or else it can be triggered by a use event uh, such as a call to the API gateway. And while invoking the Lambda functions over HTTP, you can use the AWS SDK, the CLI, or the API gateway. Now, since uh, we have talked about uh, serverless 
functions and lambdas in detail. Uh, let's also take a look at uh, why, we, why we would have to consider about uh, API management, why it is so important to uh, expose them as managed APIs. And uh, so one thing we have to keep in mind is uh, that serverless functions, uh, the serverless is a method of uh, replacing the backends. They are only they only take care about uh, like uh, running the backend in a different way. The moment we use serverless to replace backend services, uh, there's a bunch of other things we have to worry about. In this section, we are going to consider uh, about those. And uh, the moment you are going to expose your serverless uh, functions for the public consumption, you need to think about uh, security, uh, throttling, and uh, many other aspects of uh, API management. Uh, there can be functions that uh, need a user context to perform their processing. So those functions should be secured, and the user context should be passed uh, while invoking. Even for those functions, uh, which uh, for which user context is needed, still some sort of security should be imposed. So the party making the invocation can be identified. And applying throttling is important to enforce uh, fair usage of the resources. Uh, without the throttling, an invoker would be able to, uh, to make as much as invocations they need, sometimes incurring an unnecessary cost. Since serverless uh, functions by nature provide dynamic scaling, if throttling isn't applied, even a spammer would be able to spawn an unnecessary number of instances. So in order to reap the benefits, you definitely need to apply proper throttling mechanisms. And another point, uh, and another point worth considering is that uh, even if you use lambdas for backend processing, from the consuming side, uh, you'd still have to expose a RESTful interface or any type of a interface suitable for a consumer application. And when converting a backend services to lambdas, uh, you'd have to decompose it to many functions. And while doing this, you'll be simply losing the structure you originally had in your application. The logical structure of your application will be preserved, but like it will be mostly available in the document and it'll be less tangible than it was. So, but using an API management layer, you can reconstruct the structure and you can make the structure more evident and you can expose the same set of resources organized under a single API and get each resource point to a different serverless function or to a Lambda. And, and, and in the demo, we'll, we'll show you how you can do this with WS3 API Manager and with uh, AWS Lambdas. And the other point uh, worth uh, noting is uh, that once you have moved your backends uh, onto a serverless framework, that you will be able to um, more clearly identify the direct costs associated with a single invocation. And this will give an additional motivation to monetize your APIs. So when planning to monetize certain information like who the invokers are, which sort of applications they are coming from, what the access patterns can be very useful. And since an API management layer already captures this information, having API manager would help to create a better monetization plan. So another main advantage is that uh, the gateway would help to insulate certain changes better. Uh, so the API manager or an API gateway uh, can act as an intermediary layer. Uh, when having an intermediate layer, changes happening on the backend can be insulated uh, better. Um, so some organizations may move their backend uh, onto the serverless framework in order to cut down costs. Uh, but sometimes, depending on the organizational policies, they may have to move back to an on-premise data center or simply to an IAS. Now, if you've been using no layer or like or a simple proxy layer, then each time a migration is done, you would have to change the consumer applications too. But if there was an API management layer in between, you would be able to do all the changes you need to the backend without changing any of the consumer applications. The only point your consumer applications would access is the API management layer. 
So only the API management layer would know about the changes happening on the back end, so it can simply uh, insulate the changes from the applications. And yeah. And earlier, while talking about uh, AWS Lambdas, uh, we mentioned that it can be invoked by uh, um, CLIs uh, or an SDK. So both of these would require some change to be uh, done on the consumer app. Uh, but because uh, be this is because Lambdas uh, aren't accessed the same way you would make a normal HTTP call. But rather than uh, making this change on the app, uh, if you had a gateway, this translation can be easily delegated down to the API management layer, uh, making no changes on the consumer side. Now, uh, since we have a good idea about the serverless functions and why API management is important for serverless, uh, let's start looking at a bit uh, how this can be achieved in practice. And, uh, and Faslan will uh, talk uh, for the rest of the session and over to you, Faslan. Uh, thank you, Amila. So, uh, as and now, uh, you might have an understanding of what uh, lambdas are and its usages. Uh, let's focus on how you can expose a lambda function via WC2 API Manager 310 as an API and uh, reap the benefits of API management on uh, top of the advantages which lambdas provide. So, before we see how this works, in version 3.1.0, we want to make a brief explanation on how a user could have achieved the same use case in pre-3.1.0 releases. So uh, even with pre-3.1.0 releases, uh, customers were capable of integrating lambdas uh, in three ways. Uh, the first way is by exposing them through the AWS gateway. So once you expose, a Lambda via AWS gateway, you will receive an HTTP endpoint. So then you can, uh, you have the capability to connect this endpoint from the WSO2 gateway easily. The downside is that the method introduces an extra hop uh, due to the message being proxy through the AWS gateway. Uh, another mechanism is to implement a Synapse class mediator, uh, which will internally communicate to the Lambda function uh, directly skipping the AWS gateway. Uh, this option will uh, require custom development and you also you need uh, maintenance. The other method uh, is to expose uh, an HTTP endpoint uh, in an external server and communicate with the Lambda through that service. So this method introduce, introduces an extra hop and also requires a custom development. So the point I'm trying to make is uh, that uh, for pre-310 releases, all the options available for integrating lambdas involve some sort of custom development or an extra hop uh, with additional cost. So with API Manager uh, 310, uh, the lambdas uh, from uh, 310 release onwards, uh, all previous options can be discarded with the first class uh, support uh, for AWS lambdas uh, by integrating the AWS SDK within API Manager. So now instead of an endpoint, you can specify a lambda. So implicitly, this also means the consumer apps uh, wouldn't notice any difference. For example, uh, assume you had an API uh, in WC2 API Manager, which was talking to a regular HTTP endpoint. Now, if, you, if your organization decides to move this service to AWS Lambda because of its advantages, you could easily replace the endpoint uh, specified in API Manager uh, with a new Lambda function. The consumer apps uh, using this API will uh, not see any difference or compatibility issues. Uh, a regular API uh, versus an API having a Lambda endpoint is not treated differently within WC2 API Manager. So this means that 
all quality of services provided by API manager for a regular API will still be available for Lambda API as well. This includes uh, security, uh, throttling, rate uh, analytics, and so on. The next capability is uh, aggregating different Lambdas to create a single API. Uh, this way, an API with multiple resources can be connected to different Lambda endpoints Is This also fits in well with the way how services are developed in a microservices architecture. So one of the important things to understand uh, is how the gateway of WC2 API manager uh, authenticates to the Lambda function uh, to execute it. Uh, this is actually supported in uh, two modes. Uh, so the first one is using access keys. So each uh, AWS user account receives an access key and a secret key. These keys can then be used to authenticate against uh, the Lambda function. So uh, WC2 API Manager supports this option. The next option is uh, the IAM rules. Uh, this mode is recommended uh, when the API Manager instance is running in AWS. In fact, uh, this mode only works if the API Manager instance and the Lambda function is deployed using the same AWS account. Uh, in this case, you do have uh, both the options to authenticate against the Lambda. However, it is recommended to use IAM rules in such cases uh, because of the security benefits it brings in. Uh, IAM rules internally work via temporary access token generated by the EC2 instance, which is uh, far more secure than uh, embedding the access key for each call. Now that we have uh, enough understanding of uh, serverless lambdas and the benefits of exposing lambdas as APIs. Uh, let me uh, demonstrate how this works in API Manager. So uh, first of all, uh, let's log into the API Manager Publisher portal and check for the available APIs. I'm logging in with the admin credentials. You could see that uh, we have one API named uh, Pizza Shack. Uh, in published state. This means that this uh, API is available for consumption by the developer portal. So let's log into the developer portal and try to execute this API and observe the response. You can see uh, that the API uh, is available uh, in the dev developer portal. Uh, now, in order to execute this API, I would need an access token. In order to generate the access token, I need to subscribe to an application and then generate the token. So let's do that. I'm going to click on subscribe. And I have the option of generating either sandbox keys or prod keys. I'm going to choose prod keys. And I'm going to generate the token. And then I'm going to copy the token. Then go to the Tryout console. So what you see on this uh, screen is uh, the Swagger UI. Uh, this has built-in functionalities that lets us try out APIs for testing purposes. Uh, if you look at the bottom, uh, it will list down the available resources. Uh, the uh, this Pizza Shack API has two uh, resources, uh, namely menu, uh, get menu, and a post order. So let's execute it. Now we need to provide the access token uh, copied in the previous step here. And I'm going to first execute the menu resource. You can see the response of it and the uh, status code. Now let me uh, invoke the order resource as well. You need to pass a, a payload in order to uh, execute the post resource. So I'm going to provide a payload. So you can see it has responded with uh, 201 st uh, HTTP status and uh, the payload uh, like this. Uh, note that uh, this API's backend is uh, hosted locally within the API manager instance itself. Now, let's assume a scenario to move these backend logic to Lambda functions. 
So I have already created two Lambda functions to serve uh, these two resources. Let me give a glance of it for you uh, while the AWS Management Console. So this is the pizza menu Lambda function. And this is the code uh, relevant to it. And uh, this is the pizza order Lambda function. Both are written in Node.js. Okay, now let's try uh, to execute. Uh, uh, now let's try to expose these Lambda functions via APIs. For that, uh, I'll be uh, creating a new version of the existing uh, Pizza Shack API. And uh, then you have to uh, provide the, uh, you have to specify that this has a Lambda endpoint rather than HTTP endpoint. So uh, in order to do that, uh, click on endpoints on the left panel and then you can choose AWS Lambda over here. And then you have to, uh, you have two options here, uh, either using the IAM node or using AWS credentials. So I am going to use the AWS credential option. So Give me a second till I uh, copy those information. You also has, have to specify the region where the AWS Lambda uh, function is hosted. So uh, my functions are hosted in the US East one region. So I'm specifying that and clicking on save. So uh, right now uh, we have only provided uh, the uh, access credential informations. We still have to map the Lambda functions to the resources. So in order to do that, I'm going to go to the resources section and uh, click on the resource. And you can see uh, it has a section called AWS Lambda settings. So uh, we have to copy the ARM of the Lambda function uh, in here. So I'm going to copy the pizza over Lambda functions ARM over here. And uh, similarly, I'm going to copy the pizza menu functions ARM over here. Now I'm going to click on save. You also can see that uh, there is a timeout option to uh, provide. So I'm going to just use the default timeout available. And uh, currently the API is in the created state, so I'm going to publish it. So in order to do that, I'm going to go to the lifecycle section and click on publish. Right. Um, now let's go back to the developer portal. Uh, you can see uh, the dev portal has list, uh, listed down both versions of the pages API. By default, the API manager dev portal lists only the latest version of an API, uh, but this behavior can be altered via configurations. Uh, for this demo, we have chained the config to list down all versions of an API. So now let's try uh, to invoke the uh, version 2 of PageShack API. So new versions of already subscribed versions will be automatically subscribed to the same application. So you can skip the subscription option. So we, we just need to generate only the access to it. Okay, I copied the access token and I'm gonna go to the tryout section provide the access token. First, I'm gonna invoke the menu resource. You can see the Lambda function has responded with HTTP status code 200. 
and a body uh, like this. The body has a status code key, uh, a key name body, and also the headers. So let me try to invoke the order resource with the same payload as before. So you can see this, uh, uh, this also has uh, responded, uh, uh, responded with HTTP status code 200 and also with the body uh, like this. So now if you compare the responses of version one and two, uh, what you would have noticed is that they are different in the format and also the status code. If you see uh, the post request, uh, previous the version one responded with 201 while this is responding with 200 so uh, we need to do some transformation in the gateway once we receive the response uh, for, from lambdas uh, in order to match the response of version one otherwise uh, if the consumer if the consumer app start using version two instead of one there is a possibility to break because of these differences so now uh, I'm gonna uh, do a transformation to this uh, response. So I'm gonna go to the runtime configuration section and it is separated in, into request and response section. In the response section, uh, there's a message mediation uh, option. I'm gonna click on this and attach my transformation policy. Now that I have attached it, I'm going to click on save. This will uh, deploy uh, the API uh, version 2 with the new changes. So now if I uh, try out the version Pizza Shack API version 2, I should see a, a similar response as in version 1. So first I'm going to invoke the menu resource. So you can see now the response is like this. So let's execute and see. Now you can see the response has changed and it is exactly similar to version one. Similarly, I'm gonna execute the post request. And you can see now uh, it, it is responding with the same HTTP status code as version one. And also, the response uh, body is uh, similar to version one. So uh, that is all we have uh, from uh, our demo. And uh, we hope you understood how you can expose a Lambda function as a managed API uh, with WC2 API Manager. Uh, now we would like to uh, spend some time uh, to answer, uh, if, if, ask, answer some of the questions you might have. So uh, please uh, send us the questions uh, via the chat option and we will uh, pick a few out of them and uh, answer before we wind up the session. Okay, uh, one of the questions is uh, uh, how the access credentials are uh, stored. Uh, so uh, in order to answer that, so the access credentials are by default encrypted and stored in the uh, Synapse file in the WS2 gateway. So it does not need to uh, talk to any other component to receive these access uh, credentials. Okay, there is a, another question. Does it support all grant types? Uh, of course, uh, it, it supports all the grant types. Uh, uh, you can use uh, either uh, JWT tokens or uh, opac tokens with any grant type okay uh, one more question is uh, what about uh, support for connecting uh, uh, function as services of other cloud uh, providers uh, we supported aws lambda uh, first because of the adoption rate it has uh, with the community uh, this does not mean we will not support any other cloud providers uh, Azure Functions or Google Functions are in our roadmap. 
and we are hoping to uh, integrate them as uh, well very soon. Okay. Uh, so uh, we have one other question. Is it portable to micro gateway? Uh, as far as we know, uh, this functionality is still not available uh, to uh, micro gateways. Uh, uh, but uh, we will definitely uh, incorporate these uh, functionalities to micro gateway as well. As well. I think uh, that's all. So, uh, 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 that like uh, there was one other question, like uh, on uh, is it possible to debug and troubleshoot uh, the micro small services? Well, uh, there are a lot of capabilities to do so. Um, like uh, we we are we are supporting a an inbuilt feature called observability, through which you can trace down all the requests uh, that went through different components once you have enabled this feature. It will automatically uh, add a unique ID across uh, all the uh, calls that sent across. And additionally, you have the capability to enable distributed tracing options such as, such as Jaeger, uh, which also help to trace uh, a request uh, entire its uh, execution path. And then uh, you have like, uh, traditionally you can enable wire logs to uh, inspect the contents of the payload, the header and things like that. And uh, this uh, question was specifically on uh, debugging lambdas. Then yes, a certain header related information can be passed uh, to the lambda and you can uh, log it uh, and you can uh, like uh, log down that uh, from the lambda send. So yeah, basically there are a lot of options to uh, do debugging. Okay. I think uh, that's uh, it for the questions. Uh, so we can uh, download and try out our product uh, uh, via visiting uh, this link. And uh, we have a Slack channel uh, which we can, which we, uh, you can use to answer, ask any any type of question. You can uh, join the uh, Slack channel via this link. And we also have. Uh, uh, our GitHub repo, and you can uh, list down any issues in uh, the GitHub repo as well. So we have a few other webinars to follow. So uh, this is the current plan. Uh, we have a webinars plan from April 28th to May 12th. So if you are interested in any of these topics, uh, you can visit the uh, website and register yourself. Uh, that would be from our, us. Uh, so we thank everybody who uh, joined uh, this webinar and we hope that you learned something out of this. Uh, take care. Thank you. Thank you.